Okay, welcome to uh, my RBMK-1000 uh, nuclear reactor, um, which is uh, a model, uh, obviously, um, which I uh, wanted to build in Python uh, for a number of reasons. I was very, very inspired by the um, Amazon Prime series um, on Chernobyl. Um, and uh, I w the idea was is that uh, I was going to make some kind of reactor in Python uh, that was modeled after the uh, same reactor uh, and could simulate uh, the uh, disaster that happened in 1986, uh, would help me try and understand why it happened, um, and give me some basis into the uh, foundations of nuclear engineering. Um, it proved to be uh, a lot more challenging than I thought it would be. Um, I mean, uh, the, the, the one of the main things was the dynamical uh, systems that were involved. The maths was actually very invo involved, as you can see um, in all the notes here. It uh, co it, it really involved um, constantly uh, having to reshuffle um, all the uh, all the functions and recalculate them at every point in time. But anyway, have a look, um, see what you think. Uh, I uh, had a lot of enjoyment making it, um, and um, I hope uh, I hope you find it enjoyable too. Okay, so welcome to the reactor. Um, we have the uh, title screen here at the bottom, uh, just running the program in terminal. We have the RBMK-1000 Nuclear Reactor Control Center. Um, and what we're going to do is just uh, look, at the, um, look at the different menus. So we've got the Engineering Handbook here. Um, and the Engineering Handbook um, just has, um, is divided into three different parts. We've got Control. Uh, these are all the key presses. Uh, I'm going to go through those. We've got dynamics, uh, which is just some explanation to how the dynamical systems work. I haven't included everything here, but I'm hopefully going to go over some of the uh, things that, uh, that I had to overcome to make this work. Uh, then we've got abbreviations. Some Again, some of the abbreviations, we've got a lot more than that. Um, and we've got the two different options in the control room. We've got control room from rest, and we've got the control room from running. Um, so the difference is, is that if we're starting a reactor from uh, literally from rest, um, it's a very different type of um, startup system and things that we need to do uh, for reasons that I'll hopefully explain very shortly. Uh, and then we've got an option um, to uh, start the control room from running. We also have a uh, reactor condition report as well. So if the nuclear engineers want to have a report um, of all the fundamental things that are occurring in the reactor, um, then we can hit that as well. And then we can also exit the program as well. Another thing that's implemented in the program is a uh, keyboard interrupt. So uh, you don't actually have to uh, go through the menu system. You can actually just exit the program with a control C um, because the entire program is written um, in the loop function. Um, and uh, we call the loop function once with a try accept construct. Um, the accept being if there is a, uh, an error being read on a uh, keyboard interrupt i.e. being control C. So we can exit the program very uh, easily and safely by hitting control C. Um, so let's dive into the control room. Um, we're going to uh, start from the control room from running, uh, which is actually control room from rest. Um, the, the program wasn't uh, completely finished to the standard that I wanted to because um, one of the things, again, that I've mentioned previously is that building a real uh, model of a nuclear reactor is very, very hard. And it's uh, something that I uh, definitely underestimated when I... Uh, undertook the project. So um, I've got some things functioning um, and it definitely allowed me to explore some of the dynamical systems that are involved um, in a uh, RBMK-1000 reactor. Um, but the actual um, dance that has to occur between all the systems operating and the positive and the negative uh, void coefficients um, were actually a lot more challenging than I thought they would be. So anyway, let's go in and, and have a look. So we've got the reactor running from rest at the moment. Uh, and what I'm going to do is walk through um, the, we've got about, I think we've got 10 different gauges um, or control inputs. We've got 10 different things that, that we need to um, address what they are. So going from the left over here, we can see we've got um, an RPO. Uh, we've got a um, state of criticality over here. We've got RCT, Xenon 135, BCRIs, RELPOS, pumps, H2O, MGen, MGen AS, and MGen PO. So I'm going to go through what those mean um, to start with. So the RPO over here is the reactor power output. Um, now, an RBMK 1000 reactor is designed to work at 3200 uh, megawatts. Um, 
Now, during a safety test, that was brought down, was supposed to be brought down to 700 in two incremental sta stages, first from 1600, then to 700. Um, and uh, here we've got the state of criticality. So in a, in a nuclear reactor, um, there are three different stages of criticality. We've got subcritical, critical, and supercritical. Um, and that depends on the rate of neutron, neutron fission uh, reactions that are changing. So if the um, reactions are getting uh, greater uh, and the rate of fission reaction is increasing, then we're in the supercritical stage. Um, if they're stabilized, then we're in the state of critical. And if they are decreasing, then we're in subcritical. Um, and one important thing to note is that if we left a nuclear device um, to, uh, well, let's say we left the reactor to, to increase fission reaction, fission reactions, then it would increase indefinitely. Um, so let's say uh, that the reactions will, will uh, increase uh, two times per second. Um, so let's say I'd, I'm, this, is, this is beyond the scope of what I was doing, but in, in, in nuclear physics you ha you'd have something um, that would resemble the fission reactions, uh, say, uh, splitting and then splitting again and splitting again and splitting again. And if that's not controlled, um, then it would, you'd, you'd, le you'd lead to a, an exponential rise in, in reactivity. Um, and that exponential rise would, would form the basis of a 2 to the x model or a 2 to the t model. Uh, and that's one of the things that, that this project allowed me to do is to see how real mathematical functions, exponential, half exponential, um, linear, whatever the function is, actually really represent dynamical systems in, in a reactor. So, um, so, so that's modeled really with, with this 2 to the t, 2 to the t or 2 to the x. Um, and um, what we have, let me just direct your attention over here, um, because this is what really follows. The BCRIs are the boron um, control rod, uh, boron control rods uh, that are inserted, and the number. So in the um, Soviet type reactors of, of the 80s, there was uh, there was around 213 control rods. Um, Chernobyl certainly, uh, as far as I'm aware, had 213. Um, and if you have 213 control rods into the core, the reactivity should drop to zero because uh, boron control rods act as brakes um, for, for nuclear fission. Um, effectively, what they do, um, at some level at least, they absorb the uh, fission reactions. They stop uh, fission reactions occurring because they absorb the, uh, the neutrons that are flying around. So the more boron control rods that you have inserted, the lower the reactivity. Um, so those are really, really important. If we were to remove all of the boron control rods, then we would have this 2 to the t rise um, exponentially uh, and indefinitely. Uh, and if left uncontrolled, that would, that would lead to a catastrophic failure because the nuclear reactor is only designed, or the chamber holding the, the reactor is only designed to withstand a certain amount of um, reactivity. Um, but let's go back to, so we've now covered um, something of the state of criticality over here. Um, at the moment, we're reading critical because there's no increase or decrease in reactivity. Um, the RCT is the reactor core temperature. Um, and at the moment, I've set that at rest to 25 degrees C, approximately room temperature. Um, and that's going to increase with reactivity. Um, and one of the things that we need to do in order to control that is um, add... Uh, water, but before we add water, there's something over here called the relpos, and that's the relative position of the last rod that's inserted. So um, here, this is assuming that the rods are inserted at 100% insertion. In the real reactor, um, there would be it would be controlled, but you know you, incrementally um, there would be an incremental increase um, in every control rod. So you'd have even more precision on the reactivity. Uh, but here, uh, the BCRIs are assumed to be 100% inserted apart from the last one. So what we would do is that when we're trying to control the reactivity, we would first of all um, control the number of boron control rods inserted, and then to fine tune, we would adjust the relative position over here. Now, the relative positions can be moved in 10% increments um, as, as some, some degree of, of control, uh, certainly more than just inserting the last control rod. Um, then we have the pumps. So the pumps here are the water pumps. Now, in the nuclear reactor, uh, water is essential um, for the stability of the, of the fission reactions because as the reactor in increases in temperature, um, we need to uh, find a way of converting water to steam, and it's the steam that powers the turbine that 
ultimately provides the, the, the power um, that can be delivered to grid. So the pumps are absolutely important. They have the effect of one, lowering the core temperature, um, and two, uh, producing the steam that's required to power the turbine to produce the power. The H2O is the flow rate of water. So it's all very well turning the pumps on. Once we turn the pumps on, we expect to see an increase in the flow rate. Um, our, now, the flow rate of an RBMK1000 reactor should be around 42,800 liters per second. So this is in kiloliters per second. Um, and we've got the MGen here. That's the emergency generator. So the RBMK1000 reactors have three backup uh, diesel generators in the event of a uh, power failure. Why is that so important? Um, in the event of a power failure, uh, if we don't have enough power to run the pumps, then the, um, then the core reactor's temperature is going to increase dramatically. Um, once the reactor core is increasing in temperature, um, then the, um, then the, uh, the, the power output is going to increase. If the power output increases, then the temperature is going to increase, and we have this 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 infinite void coefficient that's going to increase exponentially and cause a, a, a meltdown. So it's really important that in, in the event of emergency, we can turn on these backup generators. The problem is, um, oh, and also the MGENPO is the emergency generator power output. Um, now the generator needs to be running at three thousand. RPM in order to power the emergency uh, pump, or not the emergency pumps, the pumps. Um, if we don't have 3000 RPM, then it's not going to be generating enough electricity. And at 3000 RPM, the emergency generator output is going to be 400 kilowatts. So we have to have 400 kilowatts. The problem with the emergency power generator is that it takes 60 seconds from rest for those turbines to be running at a sufficient speed. And, we're, and I'm going to run through that and demonstrate that over here. Um, and hopefully we'll have some kind of understanding about how some of the processes of, a, processes of an RBMK1000 nuclear reactor actually work. Um, and it was good fun building it. Um, I'm at the point now where I feel that if I was to develop the model anymore, it would take a lot more time than I want to allocate because I have other projects that I want to work on. Um, but it was really good fun. So with that said, let's begin. So the first thing I'm going to do is start to remove the control rods. So if you press the R key, you can see that the BCRIs is starting to decrease. Okay? And remember, this is going to follow a 2 to the T model um, with a proportionality fixed into the number of boron control rods going from 0 to 213. So if we were to remove all the boron control rods completely, fission reaction would be able to increase at 2 to the T or 2 to the X and that would literally be this exponential rise, um, which uh, is demonstrable on MATLAB. This is a, uh, a very quick uh, demonstration of how the reactivity in the core changes as a function of time and as a function of the uh, number of boron control rods that are inserted into the core uh, at a point at which the number of boron control rods are adjusted. So uh, for a subcritical uh, criticality state, we're going to have the number of boron control rods uh, lower than 143. Um, at that point, uh, the, um, the fission reactions are going to start to increase uh, exponentially. Now, if we remove all the boron control rods completely, um, we're going to allow uh, the fission reactions to uh, exponentially increase um, with a positive void coefficient. Now, if we allow this to happen, um, the reactivity is actually going to increase indefinitely uh, and result in a meltdown uh, very quickly. So uh, what we need to do is, is balance that uh, to increase the reactivity to a point where we have uh, uh, enough power, um, but uh, to ensure that we don't have this uh, positive void coefficient runoff. Now, over here, we have, after, say, two seconds, um, the reactivity, which is increasing to three, or well, that might be uh, three million um, rontons or watts. And then what we're going to do um, is 
adjust the number of boron control rods. So the first uh, BCRI indicator here is at 32, um, which is significantly below 143. Uh, so we can see that this exponential positive void uh, coefficient that's resulting in an exponential increase of reactivity. But at two seconds, what we're going to do is change um, that number. Uh, we're going to insert all the control rods immediately or issue an AZ5 execution, rapidly increase, uh, to rapidly insert all the control rods, which you would do in the event of an emergency. Um, and you can see how the uh, reactivity is, is going to decrease uh, at a negative exponential rate. And this here is going to be at a maximum negative exponential rate because all the control rods are inserted fully. However, let's say that we only, um, after three seconds, we insert, say, 126. What's going to happen is that we're actually going to still be increasing the activity, albeit at a lower rate. Uh, because remember, this is 126 is below 143, so we're in super critical stage here. If we go above 143, um, let's go as close as we can to 143. Uh, we should be in a criticality state of critical. Um, and there we go. We can see that we are not increasing or decreasing our reactivity um, at all. So the reactor in this stage would be um, considered uh, balanced and uh, that would all be good and well. Uh, let's say that in the first stage we, we want to uh, increase the reactivity a lot faster, which we would never do in real life because it's very dangerous. Uh, but let's say we only insert 10 rods and we're going to have a much higher exponential rate over here. Uh, and if we go even lower, let's we say we go to 4, um, we're gonna, we're, it's going to increase even more. Um, let's not go to 0, but let's say we go to 1. Uh, so let's, if we increase that in the first stage to say 93, that's going to be a very slow rate of increase, as we can see over here. And in the second stage as well, let's say that we want to um, gradually decrease the reactivity, bringing it down. Uh, and also, if we decrease the reactivity too fast, that can also be dangerous for reasons that will be explained later. Um, so this is really a balancing act. And what we can do is that um, we can adjust the B factor over here, which is the time domain point of transition. So let's say that we, wanna, um, we want to allow this transition to occur at, at, say, four seconds. We would just move this slider to four seconds over here like that, and we should get a recalculation, as we do very nicely over here. And the reason why I wanted to show this is because in the real reactor, um, this is dynamically changing uh, at every single point in time that the BCRI values are increasing or decreasing. So, for instance, if you want to uh, increase the number of boron control rods or decrease the number of boron control rods by one, by two, by three, at any point in time, then at that point in time, we have to find a function that is going to represent this red line over here. Um, and then consequently, at the end of this red line, we're going to have another blue line and then the red line um, until infinity. So until we, uh, we end the simulator. So this is just something that has to be uh, programmed in, in Python in the processor section in order for the uh, reactivity as a function of time and the boron control rods um, that are inserted to work correctly. Now, as you've seen on MATLAB, if we reduce um, the boron control rods um, that are inserted, we start to deviate from this 2 to the x towards 0 0.5 to the x, 0 0.5 to the t, because we're going to be reducing at the same rate once we have 213 control rods inserted. Now, what has to be implemented in the programming is that every single time I insert a control rod, we take or we start from the last value of the power output, and we now uh, plot a new function um, of this a to the x, and a to the x, the a being uh, the base being proportional to the number of boron control rods, going from 0 to 213, representative going from 2 to the x to 0 0.5 to the x at any point in time. So that was one of the challenges that I had to overcome. So let me try and demonstrate that. So let's remove um, the control rods over here. Uh, remember, at 213, we're 
approximately or very close to 0.5 to the x. So we're just reducing everything. I'm already starting at zero. So we need to be at at least at at least 143 control rods um, before we start to increase anything. And 143 control rods, as you saw in the MATLAB file, we start to get a very, very slow positive exponential rise. So let's just do that. Um, so pretending that I'm the nuclear engineer in the fact in the in the facility, I'm gonna keep removing these control rods. We were at 168, and you can see nothing else is actually changing at the moment. Another thing I'm going to do before I actually go um, below 143 control rods, I'm going to show you what happens when I turn the pumps on. Watch over here. You can see the pumps just over here. So watch what happens over here when I turn the pumps on by pressing P. Pumps off, pumps on. Pumps off, pumps on. You can see that the arrows also change direction to make it very nice and clear. How much water is running through the system when the pumps are on? Nothing. The pumps are off. Nothing. Pumps are on. Nothing. So that's really bad. The reason why there's no water running through the reactor is because we have no power powering those pumps. Remember, the, re the reactor is, is, is running at zero megawatts. The emergency generator is at zero kilowatts. So we have, obviously, we're going to have no power. So the pumps on or off not going to make any difference. So let's try turning on the emergency generator and see what happens. Now remember, if you have a stopwatch, time it. It should be very accurate. And one of the other things is that when you turn on uh, like a power, the motor, um, you should be able to see this, this gradual ri rise in acceleration to this terminal acceleration where the, um, where the uh, RPM increase is going to stabilize and then it's going to level off at its terminal value. As we can see that this uh, accelerates from rest to, um, well, a terminal RPM of around 3,200. In fact, it is 3,200. Um, and then we have the 95% uh, steady state value um, over here at uh, 3,000 RPM. Uh, and that occurs at 60 seconds. So that is really in line with the uh, with the RBMK turbine generators. There were three uh, t uh, three backup uh, diesel power generators that took 60 seconds uh, to re to uh, to reach the required um, uh, revolution uh, revolutionary speed to provide the electricity that would power the water pumps that were essential for the reactor. Um, and what you want to model, uh, what I wanted to model in the in the Python uh, program was the deceleration and the acceleration at any point in time. So uh, let's say that the uh, the RPM value went above its um, required speed and then we turned the generator off because the power could then be um, derived via the bus from the actual uh, nuclear reactor turbine. Um, it would uh, fall to rest with the same rate as rise over here. Uh, and then let's say we decided to turn the, the turbine on again, uh, we would have this function again repeat over here um, with a time shift, which, uh, which obviously had to be constantly um, reprogrammed automatically as the, as the turbine generator was turned on and off. So uh, one of the things that we should be able to notice in the program is this type of response when we turn the generator on and off and on and off at any point in time. Um, so let's have a go at that and let's turn on the emergency generator and hopefully what we should see is that the RPMs are going to start to increase um, towards uh, 3200 I believe is the terminal um, angular speed uh, and the power should start to increase as well. Uh, now remember we only need 3000 RPM uh, equivalent that should register at 400 kilowatts in order to provide enough electrical power to, to, to power the pumps. Um, so let's turn on the generator. Now as soon as I've turned the generator on, immediately we can see the RPMs are increasing now um, and the power output as well being delivered is also increasing. Okay, so that's really nice. And from the time that I press the generator on switch, it should take 60 seconds. Uh, and that's really important because during the Chernobyl disaster of 1986, they were running a test to see whether or not the emergency generators would, be, would provide sufficient power 
to run those pumps um, when the reactor was at, um, at uh, reduced operating power. Um, because in a real disaster, when you lose power, those emergency generators need to kick in as quickly as possible. Okay, so um, here we are. We're at 378 kilowatts rising. We're at 2,874 RPM rising. At 3,000 RPM, we should be able to turn the pumps on. We're approaching. And now, can you see in the dynamics of how this is working? Here we are. We've reached 3,000 RPM, 400 kilowatts confirmed. Um, can you see how the revolutions per minute are now starting to die off? So that's actually quite similar to how a real motor uh, or a turbine would start to level off at its terminal angular speed. So now if we turn the pumps on, watch what happens to the flow rate. We can see the flow rate is rising, rising, rising steadily, increasing, 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 until we get to a terminal uh, flow increase velocity and then it's going to keep rising until its terminal um, final flow rate of 43,800 liters per second, which is what we have. That's fantastic. So now we have 43,800 liters per second running through the reactor. Um, we can still see the generator is starting to stabilize at 3,000, uh, well, it's tending towards 3,200 RPM. The power delivered by the emergency diesel power generators are 425 kilowatts. Um, and that's all good. Now, let's see what happens if we turn off the generator but keep the pumps on. So what we should start to notice is that the pump should function perfectly until the um, angular speed gets to 3000 RPM or the power output is less than 400 kilowatts. So I'm going to turn the generator off after four seconds and watch what happens as the RPM falls below 3000 and the uh, hydrogen to the H2O flow rate um, should start to decrease once 3000 RPM threshold is no longer maintained. So here we go after four, three, two, one. Here we are, RPM falling, 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 falling. And here we are, we've gone below 3000 and the flow rate is now starting to decrease rapidly. Um, and that will go all the way to zero. Uh, because even though the pumps are on, the pumps do not have enough electrical bus to, to power them. So here we are, it's gone to zero. So it doesn't matter if I turn the pumps off, if I turn them on, it doesn't matter because the power being provided by the emergency generators are less than 400 kilowatts. And that's going to fall steadily towards zero. So I'm actually going to turn on the generator. In fact, you know, I'm going to turn the generators off. I'm going to allow those to stabilize at zero. I'm going to allow those to fall to zero. Now, what I'm going to do is a little bit naughty. I'm going to actually increase the reactivity by reducing the boron control rods. Um, in fact, you know what? I'm not going to do that. I'm going to turn the generators on as they would in a real reactor. Um, and I'm going to turn the pumps on. Again, see the pumps making no difference whatsoever until the power reaches 400 kilowatts. So let's just wait a little bit again. Um, and again, the nice thing about this is that what's working is that we can turn them off, we can turn them on. It doesn't make a difference um, at any point. The functions are recalibrating themselves at any point. So I can keep turning the generators on and off, and we're going to get this nice exponential rise um, with an with a acceleration that reaches a terminal acceleration of, of power and, um, and revolutions per minute. Okay, we're approaching 400 kilowatts. Um, I'm going to leave the pumps on so you can see that immediately at 400 kilowatts we have enough power to uh, for the pumps to start pumping water into the reactor. So just again, watch at 3000 RPM or 400 kilowatts, we should start to notice um, what's going on. Here we are, 3000 RPM, the pumps have engaged and the flow rate is now increasing, 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 increasing until we get to a terminal velocity of flow. And now this is increasing until 43,800. Great. So that's good. We're at 43,800 kiloliters. And then what I'm going to do is that if we have enough power, which we should do from the reactor at some point, I'm going to turn off the emergency generator and see if the pumps are still able to provide um, water because they should do because remember the pumps are connected from two electrical sources we've got the power from the generator the emergency diesel power generators and there's three of them or we've got power from the turbine of the reactor so I'm now going to hopefully um, put the 
state of criticality of the reactor into supercritical via reducing the number of boron control rods that are inserted. So I'm going to remove the control rods. Just to show you now, um, I'm at 400, 143, I'm going to remove the relative position of the last control rod. Uh, well, I was actually increasing it over here, just to show you the effect of um, the percentage here. So if we press the E and the O keys, uh, we can see that I'm increasing the last rod um, by now, so the last rod now is at 100%. It's not going to go beyond that. Um, I'm going to put the last rod at 50%. Now I'm going to remove the actual control rods even further. And we should notice the core's temperature start to increase. So I'm going to put the control rods, um, let's say I'm going to remove a lot, I'm going to go down to say 100 and let's say 96 control rods. So now what we expect to happen is that the fission reactions should now start to be on some kind of a possible, positive exponential curve as was demonstrated in MATLAB before. Um, now remember, this is proportionate to the t from 2 to the t to 0.5 to the t. So we're definitely now in supercritical stage. It's, here we're critical, and the reason why it says critical is because I've calibrated this in programming to only make an adjustment if we go beyond, I think, 7 megawatts. Um, otherwise, the state of criticality will be changing too, too violently um, when we're trying to get the reactor critical um, at a positive power uh, delivery. So um, it's only going to change from critical to subcritical to critical um, if it detects a change of over 7 megawatts. But at the moment, what I suspect is happening, what I hope is happening, is that the fission reactions are, uh, are getting larger and larger and larger, um, but at a rate of something greater than 1 to the t. So we might be at something like 1.2 to the t, 1.3 to the t, 1.5 to the t, which is a positive exponential uh, increase, as we would expect, but there are breaks being applied. We're not letting this run at 2 to the t. We're not letting this run at 2 to the x, as would happen if we re would remove all the control rods. So let's be patient and let's see what happens. And hopefully what we should start to see is that the um, reactor output over here uh, will uh, gradually start to increase. And that's what we want. In a real reactor, we don't want to do anything dramatic. We don't want to um, remove, we'd never remove all the, all the control rods. Um, uh, we want to have a steady um, controlled uh, response. We want to have a steady controlled increase in the power. Uh, and by the way, we do exactly the same thing if we want to reduce the reactivity in the core. We don't do anything radical um, unless, unless there's some kind of emergency. Um, now, just while the reactor is, uh, is, is, is increasing in reactivity, um, let me talk about uh, the emergency stop feature, which is built into any nuclear reactor. In the Chernobyl reactor, um, or the, the RBM K1000, which is what this is modeled after, there's a switch called the AZ-5. The AZ-5, um, effectively, if that's executed, um, all the control rods will immediately go in at, at the fastest possible rate into the reactor. Um, and that will effectively, or should apply, um, the greatest breaking power to fission reactivity. Um, another thing that I should note over here as well is the Xenon-135. Xenon-135 is a poison, um, and it's something that is um, very, very problematic in the nuclear reactor, um, and it's something, it's a byproduct that's produced um, as uranium-235 is um, undergoes fission. Um, but it's not really a problem if the uh, temperature in the core uh, reaches a certain threshold. After a certain threshold, I think here it's something around 300 to 400 degrees, I can't remember now, but you should see the Xenon 135 starts to burn away. Um, if the Xenon 135 is allowed to build up, um, then that can cause a, um, a chain reaction that can actually radically increase the reactivity in the reactor, um, instability, and even a meltdown. So the Xenon 135 is, is a byproduct that any nuclear engineering team will have to monitor very closely. But again, that's normally not a problem. At the moment, we're at 30 kilograms, which is a big problem, but we haven't got any reactivity at the moment, so we're okay. Okay, I've just gone uh, back up to 143. Um, let's go down uh, now uh, below 143. Um, And hopefully what we should start to see is the reactivity starting to rise. 
Um, I'm not sure how many control rods would be normal procedure. Ah, look at this. Here we are. Can we can see the, the megawatts are now rising in the core at 8, 9, 10. The temperature is rising quite rapidly. I'm going to quickly, quickly go up, bring it up, back up. Oh, oh my, okay, okay, this is too fast, too fast, too fast. We can see the Xenon 135 is decreasing. I'm back at 143, 147, 146, 145. Okay, okay, all right. Well, that was quite uh, quite a tense moment there. Um, we're at subcritical now because we're falling down. Um, reactivity, the reactivity in the core is now rising. We're at 48.9, 48.6, 5432 and descending. Uh, the Xenon 135 concentration now is rising again because the temperature in the core is decreasing um, and the output is also decreasing because the control rods are now above 143. Um, what I'm going to do is now reduce the number of control rods. I'm going to take them out below 143 and we should start to see the um, power in the core reactivity rise and it is. We're now getting a warning from the computer of supercritical um, the temperature in the core is now rising. We're at 49.2 and rising. Uh, power delivery is 85 megawatts and rising. The Xenon 135 concentration is now burning off, which is what we would expect. I'm going to increase the... Now, if I just leave this as it is, the rate of reactivity... Remember, this is a positive exponential curve that the uh, reactivity is following, that rate is actually going to keep increasing. So if I remove it, more control rods, the slope is going to be even higher. Um, so I don't really want to do that. You can see the temperature now rising more rapidly. You can see the Xenon 135 concentration now burning off a little bit faster. You can see that the power output is increasing at a higher rate. We're now at 1697, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. We're getting much, much faster now. Uh, we're at 192, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 2. We're, we're getting much, much faster. Um, now, the RBMK reactor was designed to operate at 3,200 megawatts. So um, I'm actually going to let this rise at the current rate it is. It is. Um, and this is a little bit similar to what um, a nuclear engineering team might do in a reactor uh, because they're balancing the um, reactivity um, from the accelerators to the brakes, what's increasing your activity, what's reducing your activity. Um, so we're now getting the Xenon 135 approaching zero, um, which is good. Um, super critical. Uh, we've still got a long way to go before we get to 3200 megawatts. So once the Xenon 135 is totally burnt off, I'm actually going to remove some more control rods, um, and hopefully that will increase the rate of rise uh, of reactivity um, in the supercritical stage so that we can get to 3200 megawatts a little bit faster. Um, we're at now 2.1 kilograms, Xenon 135. Um, let's wait until the Xenon 135 is completely burnt off. Um, you can see how much faster the power in the reactor is increasing. Um, in fact, I don't think I do want to increase the rate of that even more. I want to reduce the rate. So I'm actually going to insert a control rod. And I'm going to insert another control rod. We're at 143, critical. Okay, that's moving too slowly. Um, so I'm going to keep it at 142. If I do remove some more control rods, just I'll show you what starts to happen. So I'm now down to 137. We can see it. the rise in megawatt delivery is much, much faster. If I remove even more at 1,300, 400, 500, 600, 700, 1,800, 1,900 megawatts and rising, 2, 2, 2, 3, 24, 25, 26, 27. I need to rapidly get to 142, uh, the BCRIs. Okay, I'm now at 143. We're at 3,200 megawatts, super critical. I want to slow down even further, so I'm going to insert another one. But now we're falling, we're in subcritical stage. So let's go to back to 143. We're going from critical, uh, subcritical to critical to supercriticality. And we're now in supercritical. We're rising. So I need some more control now at 143 boron control rods. If I increase if I insert another control rod to 144, we're going to go back to subcritical. 
I don't want to go to subcritical now. I want to be at critical. I want to stabilize the reactor at 3200 megawatts. So now I need some more fine tuning on that 2 to the x from uh, 0.5 to the x to 2 to the 5 exponential curve. And I'm going to use that by the relative position of the last control rod over here. We're at 50%. So using the O and the E keys, I'm now going to be able to fine tune that last control rod. And that should give me even more uh, directionality. We're at subcritical. Subcritical, I want to increase reactivity. So I want to take out the last control rod completely. See, now we're in critical, subcritical, supercritical, critical. So I'm going to, um, we're in subcritical, so I want to increase. There we go, lovely. That's stabilizing at 2,780. Subcritical, 2,760. Subcritical, subcritical, we want to be increasing reactivity, so we want to remove, oh, 144 control rods, that's why. Let's remove another control rod. Aha, now we're in supercritical stage. Let's go into fine tuning again. The last control rod now it's 70%, 80%, and that's looking really nice. If we go to 90%, that's looking really nice. That's beautiful. Wow, fantastic. So we've now inserted 143 control rods. The last control rod is inserted 90% of the way. Um, we do have a subcritical report here, but that's okay. Um, if we wanted to refine the program even more, and then obviously the real reactor, we wouldn't just have a tenth of a of a of, of a percentile control. So not sorry, not a tenth. We wouldn't have we wouldn't have control over a tenth of the uh, displacement of the entire control rod. We would have complete control of that control rod. But over here, I've just modeled it as such that we've got only a tenth of a control um, increment of the of the last control rod. So that's why we, it's difficult to get complete criticality stage. Um, state of com complete and ideal criticality. Um, remember, there's never going to be an absolute criticality because in absolute criticality, the number of fission reactions that are occurring the instant after are going to be absolutely identical to the to the instant before. So there's always going to be a degree of 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 um, of, uh, of of error here. Um, that, that we need to allow. So here I've, I've allowed for seven megawatts, which is very large, but uh, it's, only, uh, it's only my first attempt. So. <laughs> um, okay, so we're now at 2,700. I'm going to increase slightly by removing the relative position um, and hopefully getting that up a little bit because I want to try and stabilize as close as, close as possible to 3,200. Um, 3, um, so I'm going to let that go to supercritical a little bit more. The temperature is going to rise a little bit more. You can see that we burnt off all the xenon 135, which is good, really good. We want to keep an eye on that. Um, one of the dangers is that if the reactor is operated at too low a um, output, then the xenon 135 starts to accumulate. 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 Um, can't say the word. Um, I mean, in, in the Chernobyl disaster, for instance, the xenon 135 was um, accumulating for um, around about 12 hours, which was one of the reasons. One of one of one of the one of the uh, links in the chain of, 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 of disasters that happened that time. Um, so now we're um, approaching uh, 3,000. I'm going to... Um, and you can see how quickly this, this exponential uh, behavior really starts to increase. So I'm going to now uh, insert that last control rod a little bit more. 70%, 80%, 70%, 80%, and I'm going to leave it at 80% because we're now in a stage of criticality, and yet I suspect that that would go to supercritical because we are increasing a little bit more. Um, but that's relatively stable for me. Again, I'm, I, when we get to 3200, then I'll, I'll, I'll just insert the last control rod from 80% to 90% to swing it back a little bit. But what I wanted to demonstrate now is that now that we have um, approaching um, 3100 megawatts, we should be able to keep the pumps running without the emergency generator. So what I'm going to do is shut down the emergency generator and hopefully we should see that when the power delivered by the emergency generator falls below 400 kilowatts uh, and the um, angular speed of, the, of those turbines go below 3000 RPM, the um, H2O flow rate should remain at 43,800 liters per second. So I'm going to do that now after 3, 2, 1. There we have it. The generators are now producing less than 400 kilowatts. We've fallen below 3,000 revolutions per minute. 
but the pumps still remain functional at 43,800 liters per second, which is fantastic because it means that the pumps are now getting the power from the reactor. If we turn the pumps off, we can start to see the flow rate start to decrease, which is very dangerous. So I'm going to turn them back on again. <laughs> And um, we can start to see them increase as well. And just from the point of view of the mathematical dynamics at play here, you can see that when I turn the pumps on or off, you get this nice slow motion at the beginning. This, uh, this slow rate of increase or decrease, it reaches a terminal flow rate, and then, um, and then the same happens at any single point in time. So if I turn the pumps off here, it's starting to flow off, and then it's starting to, and then we get this terminal flow rate coming out. If I turn the pumps on at any point, we start to get this motion. So it's so it hopefully repl replicates something of, of of real dynamical systems. And you can see that the um, the turbine of the emergency generators are, are steadily falling as well. Remember, it did take sixty seconds to power up, so we can expect those turbines to take around sixty seconds to um, stabilize back to rest again. Um, and they're still producing some power, which is which is nice. In the test that occurred in 1986, one of the things they wanted to do was see whether or not these turbine generators could provide enough power to the pumps in the event that the, um, that the, uh, that the reactor shut down. And this is really as far as that I've got in, in terms of modeling the RBMK reactor, um, in terms of understanding the, um, the, the disaster that happened uh, in, in Ukraine. And uh, the, the last thing that I really want to show is the emergency switch, which was the AZ-5 in the case of the Chernobyl reactor. All Russian Soviet reactors had this emergency button called AZ-5. And the idea was, again, that the, all the boron control rods were immediately uh, inserted uh, wherever they were at, at, at the fastest rate possible. And that should hopefully shut down the reactor. So what I'm going to do is simulate a disaster now. I'm going to be very, very um, naughty. I'm going to remove control rods. I'm going to remove them. I'm going to go all the way down to 130, which isn't really that much. You can start to see the reactor really rise very rapidly. Um, the, uh, the explosion occurred at 32,000 megawatts. Um, we're at 11,000, 12,000, 13,000, 14,000, 15,000 megawatts and rising. If I just insert more control rods, that will start to decrease. I'm going above 143. We're now in subcritical uh, territory now, so we're actually reducing. But you can see the temperature rising here is, is very dangerous now. Um, what I'm going to do is actually stabilize at, um, at uh, approximately this, this temperature, and I'm going to turn the pumps off. And what you should start to notice is the temperature um, is going to be really, really affected here quite, quite rapidly. Um, so let me see if I can stabilize the reactor even more. Um, we're, okay, so we're around 4,900 degrees. I'm going to turn the pumps off. And as I turn the pumps off, the water flow rate is now reducing. And as the reactor has less water to cool it down, we can see that the temperature is now rising very rapidly, going above 5,000, uh, 5,100. And it's really going very, very quickly. So I'm going to turn the pump on uh, now, and you should start to see the temperature fall by a couple of hundred degrees at least. So again, as, the, as there's more water going, flowing into the reactor, the, uh, the temperature of the core is now decreasing. Um, but what I'm going to do, I'm going to, again, be very irresponsible. I'm going to start to pull out control rods, um, and we can see the reactor uh, output now is really accelerating very quickly. Okay, we're, we're now past 3300. Um, at this stage, the reactor would have exploded. Um, I'm going to initiate an emergency stop. I'm going to hit the AZ-5 button. And what we should notice is two things, three things, actually. We should notice the boron control rods rapidly um, increase to 213, incrementally, of course, but at 30 rods per second, um, which is the maximum that my motor drives are capable of driving in. I'm not sure what the real ones were capable of doing, but we're going to do it at 30, 30 rods per second. The temperature should decrease rapidly, and the power should fall to zero very quickly in relation to the number of control rods. So let's hit AZ5 after 3, 2, 1, 0.
There we go. AZ5 has been initiated. The brawn control rods have got to 213. And look what we can see here as well, that the pumps are now not uh, producing enough electricity. There's no, there's no electricity to power the pumps, so they've just uh, the H2O levels have fallen to zero. So I hope you enjoyed that. That was a little um, attempt uh, for me to um, uh, come to grasps with some of the concepts in nuclear engineering. Um, there's obviously far, far more sophistication um, that needs to be done to model this um, to, uh, to, a, to a real degree of accuracy, um, such as the positive void coefficient. Um, but those things were actually a lot more difficult than I thought because you have multiple um, outputs that are dependent on multiple processes. Um, and that was actually quite hard to implement. So I hope you enjoyed it. It was good fun making this, but I'm not putting any more time into it. I've got other things I want to do.